thank you both for coming tonight. Спасибо оба, что вы пришли сегодня. Since God is omnipotent, так как Бог вездесущ и все знающий, it would be fair to make the assessment. То есть мы можем сказать и можем заявить that his omnipotence is a byproduct of him being the prime mover of all things. So my question is, since some of God's creatures will perish, God created them knowing that they will perish. Why would a God of love choose to do that? Let me just unpack the question a little bit for you, sir. When you talk about a byproduct of being God, be careful with that word. Okay. Uh, omnipotence is not a byproduct of, of Him, it is an essential part of Him. That's the first thing. The second thing is this. Don't assume that omnipotence means God can do anything. That is a wrong definition of omnipotence. God cannot make square circles because they are two mutually exclusive terms. God can, God can only do that which is not mutually exclusive. And to create us as free beings and constantly violate that freedom is to do something that's mutually exclusive. That would be a violation of omnipotence. Omnipotence can only do that which is possible. And that which is mutually exclusive is contradictory. And there is no contradiction in God. So also be clear in your mind on the definitions of these terms. That's a good question. Thank you. Leah from Monroe, Louisiana writes in with a heavy question. Pastor John, if the triune God was perfectly joyful and glorious in union and fellowship with himself before the creation of the world, why, knowing that some of his creation would reject him and suffer eternal punishment, why would he create the world for his own glory? Why was his glory in creating the world worth the eternal damnation of the non-elect? Well, that's about as heavy as they get. Um, but let me, let me make sure that we lay the foundations for the question and the answer. She, she's laid them. She's assuming them rightly, I think. But le- not everybody listening might see those foundations. So first, God knows everything that will come to pass in the future. Both Isaiah and Jesus and others say this. Isaiah 46, I am God. And there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. In other words, in Isaiah's mind, the godness of God includes foreknowledge of everything that comes to pass. Jesus says the same thing about himself. He says, when he's predicting the betrayal by Judas, he says, I am telling you this now. Before it takes place, this is John thirteen nineteen. I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am. Now, most translations say that I am he, but it's just that I am, and the echo is I am who I am, Jesus claiming to be divine here, and the evidences of his divinity is that he knows the future acts of responsible human agents like Judas. So that's the first foundation that needs to be laid. Yes, God foreknows everything that comes to pass, and he foreknew everything before he created everything, what would come to pass, and that's why the question is so relevant. Second foundation, God knew that sin would enter the world, and he planned for redemption before there was a world. And we can see that in passages that talk about grace 
being planned for sinners before there was even a world where there was sin that needed grace. Ephesians 1, 4, God chose us in him before the foundation of the world. He predestined us to the praise of the glory of his grace. So we were chosen before the foundation of the world to experience grace, which is God's response to guilty people. Same thing in 2 Timothy 1, 9. God saved us and called us to a holy calling because of his own purpose and grace which he gave us before the ages began. So grace is planned before there was any sin, so God knows there's going to be sin that needs grace. And Revelation 13, 8, all of them will worship the beast whose names are not written before the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb who was slain. So there's a book before the foundation of the world in which names are being written, and the name of the book is the life of the Lamb who was slain. So God planned before the foundation of the world that there would be a Lamb who was slain for sinners. Therefore, yes, God knew the whole thing that was coming down. So God knows it all, and he means to do it all, do redemption, do history, according to Ephesians 1, 6, in pursuit of the display of the glory of his grace. That's the goal of creation and redemption, the, the communication of the glory, of the grace of God for the everlasting enjoyment of his people. So his glory and our joy are the united purpose of God in creation. And now the question that was asked is, why would God move forward with this plan? in view of the millions of people who will not be saved but suffer eternal conscious torment. And Leah is right to ask it this way because hell is real and terrible. And Jesus taught that it was real and the apostles taught that it was real. A little glimpse would be Revelation 14, 11, where John writes of the uh, the devil and his angels and those who do not believe will be in hell, the, the lake of fire. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. So it is torment, and it is endless, and it is day and night. So God knew that that would happen, and the text that I think comes closest to answering Leah's question is Romans 9, 22 to 23, and it goes like this. What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction? And then here's the key explanatory purpose clause. He does that. He endures vessels of wrath in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he prepared beforehand for glory. So if I understand this passage, Paul is saying, and this is, this is the key sentence, God endured for a season the unbelief and rebellion of those who reject him so that his wrath and power would be justly displayed in their punishment so that those who do believe will see the glory of his grace more fully in relation to the justice of his wrath. If, the, if, if she pursues the question further, which I think she is, why would God move forward with this plan to communicate his grace at such a cost? The only thing I know to say, Leah, is we must trust God's infinite wisdom in this. He has done all things well. The judge of all the earth will do right so that, number one, no one will perish who does not justly deserve to perish. Two, in heaven there will not be the slightest suspicion that God has acted unjustly. And three, all who are saved know they deserve to be in hell. We know this, and the fact that we are not in hell, and some are justly in hell, while we are in heaven, will not make us doubt God, but will make us amazed with thankfulness for this utterly undeserved grace.
Amen. What grace indeed. Thank you, Pastor John. And as you were talking about Romans 9, verses 22 to 23, it reminded me of an episode we recorded a while back titled, Is God a Needy Vacuum Trying to Suck Praise Out of Us? That was episode number 293. It complements kind of what we addressed here, and it is well worth your time if you've been asking heavy questions like this one from Leah. We're going to take a break for the weekend now. As always, you can look back on the episodes from the week and search our archive of hundreds of episodes in our new landing page on our website. Go to DesiringGod.org, and at the top of the page, click on the tab that says More, and then click on Ask Pastor John. Feel free to take some time this weekend to get acquainted with these new features on the website. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. Have a wonderful weekend.